Runway 3 Sierra Delta on course to the northwest, runway 34, clear for takeoff. On course to the northwest, on t uh, clear for takeoff, 34, 3 Sierra Delta. Well, hello and welcome. What started out as a simple little couple minute video has kind of had a little what we'll call scope creep. Uh, as I get on my bandwagon here and uh, trying to tone it down and keep this shorter. So let's just say, you know, as a pilot, CRM, cockpit resource management, is a critical component of safe flight. And we all know that. Actually, this was a video that was supposed to be put together for non-pilots to understand why we use an autopilot, what, how the autopilot generally works at a very high level. The autopilot like all of our instrumentation, is important to safe flight, but it, it is really, really critical. And especially in the general aviation world of private pilot, it's probably both the most underused and overused resource in the cockpit. And the reason I say it is both of those things, because I fly with a lot of pilots that use their autopilot all the time. And why not? It's a tremendous workload reliever. It allows us to delegate, not abdicate, our responsibility of flying the plane to a very precise instrument that works the vast majority of the time. But what I worry about is when we as pilots, as private pilots, we use the autopilot so much that I worry about our skills of being able to hand fly the airplane beginning to atrophy. And that especially happens when you think about if you're in the clouds, pilots are required to scan all of the instruments because we can't see outside the cockpit to ensure that we remain on course and on altitude and that we see impending issues potentially with the mechanics of the engine with the um, temperatures and pressure. So we have a scan. And when we let the autopilot do the flying, we don't practice our scanning. And I think you could probably, if you're a non-pilot, just imagine you're on a two-hour flight and your eyes are constantly scanning instruments, making sure that you're flying perfectly. It's exhausting over a couple hour period. That's why we love the autopilot so much, but when we stop using those skills, we can lose proficiency in that. Now, on the other hand, for people and some private pilots, especially if they fly older airplanes or they're older, maybe they don't have access to an autopilot or a, a highly functional autopilot, you can imagine how frustrating it is for someone like me and other pilots to read about aircraft accidents, especially those that end in fatalities, whereby the pilot didn't have the working knowledge of how to use their autopilot, and because of that, maybe ended up in a fatal situation. There are a lot of examples out there, but for many of us, the JFK Jr. flight comes to mind of so many years ago. Because JFK Jr. had no visual reference to uh, the horizon while flying at night over water, he didn't know and wasn't able to discern from his instruments that he was in a descending turn. And all he saw was the descent. So as he pulled the yoke or the stick or the steering wheel, however you want to call it if you're a non-pilot, uh, pulled it back to raise the nose because he didn't realize he was in a bank, he actually was steepening the bank and entered into what we call a graveyard spiral. He was literally two button pushes away from having a safe flight if he had known or had chosen autopilot. So we need to maintain our proficiency and the simple way to do that, of course, is to practice both hand flying and practice use of the autopilot. One way that was suggested to me in the past was to use the autopilot when flying in instrument meteorological conditions in a cloud or in reduced visibility. And then when the visual conditions are good, then you hand fly it. You know, I personally like to hand fly when I'm in the terminal area, especially Chicago, so much going on. So when I'm in the departure, the initial climb, or the arrival and the approach into a terminal area, I love to hand fly because it really challenges me. But when I get to cruise altitude and I'm going to be two hours on one direction at one altitude, I use the autopilot. So each of these exercises a different muscle and skill, and both are perishable skills at that. So as I mentioned, today's video is really to introduce the autopilot to my non-pilot viewers. But understanding there are private pilots out there that either never had access to an autopilot, just never made it a priority to, to learn how to use it, Today's episode is meant to cover this valuable resource, but at a very high level.
Autopilots range from basic wing levelers to highly advanced tools that control every aspect of a flight from departure through an approach to landing. Many of today's small aircraft have pretty cool autopilots from companies like Aztec, Garmin, and Avidyne. And I know a lot of my friends fly older aircraft that might have something like a KFC 200 from King. All of them are extremely functional and can really contribute to safe flight. At its core, the autopilot provides control on a horizontal, left and right, and vertical, up and down, basis. For the horizontal, it either flies a magnetic or a compass heading that the pilot sets with the heading bug, or it tracks the signal that originates on the ground or from a GPS satellite. The ground-based signal is produced by a device called a VOR, or might be an airport antenna at the airport, called a localizer. Generally speaking, the VOR or localizer are fixed location and the instrumentation points to that device so that the pilot can navigate to those locations whether they're using the autopilot or not. The GPS essentially creates pretend antennas, what we call waypoints, and like the VOR, the pilot uses the same method to fly to those locations, again, whether they're doing it on their own or they're doing it with the autopilot. Now when we talk about vertical perspective, the up and down, the pilot uses the altitude bug. There's that word again. And the bug, in this case to set the altitude, sets where we want to go eventually, not at the current altitude that we're at, unless we want to lock that one in. And the autopilot can take the plane to that altitude and hold it there with wonderful precision. Last thing that I want you to understand is a concept that we call the flight director. Think of the flight director as a main computer that takes in all the data, like wind, barometric pressure, the pilot's input on desired tracking, and altitude, etc. And then using a visual aid we call the command bars, it depicts what control inputs will achieve the desired result of direction, altitude, and etc. When we turn on the autopilot, it does what the flight director tells it to do. If we leave the flight director on but turn the autopilot off, then the command bars are used by the pilot to make climbs, descents, and turns to also ensure we get to our destination on the right path at the right altitude. Essentially, the pilot uses the controls to tuck the aircraft reference symbol right under the command bars. When the bars move, we use our controls to keep that reference symbol tucked under here, as you see that I have it right now. I love hand flying with the flight director. It makes my job easier by giving me one single item to look at to get everything I need to keep the plane on course and on altitude. So with all that, how do we activate the autopilot? Well, with slight variations between different autopilots, all the pilot has to do is tell the autopilot whether we are flying a compass heading or a navigation signal. We do that by pushing either the HDG button or the NAV button then tell it to hold the current altitude by pressing the ALT button. Or we can tell it to change altitude by setting the altitude bug for the specific altitude, and then tell the autopilot whether to climb or descend at a specific rate in terms of number of feet change per minute, or at an indicated airspeed, which means it will now climb or descend to that altitude at the, uh, at the uh, airspeed that we ask it to. And we do that because an airplane needs a certain amount of speed to keep the wings flying, and because we lose speed in the climb, thanks to that wonderful thing called gravity, many pilots fly based on speed in the climb and use the rate of altitude change in the descent. It sounds complicated, but once the concept is understood, there is very little thought, and a few button pushes needed to create an additional pilot in the cockpit for you, taking on that load. So going back to my reference about JFK Jr., if he had either pushed the heading or nav button in terms of the directional control, as well as the ALT, altitude button, there would have been no fatalities in that airplane that day. That's all it would have taken. As pilots, we are accountable for remaining knowledgeable and proficient at all things that ensure the safety of every flight. Our checklist and our process is comforting and it helps keep us safe but things will happen that force us out of our comfort zone. And we need to be ready to switch modes and remain in command and control of our aircraft. So knowing your aircraft systems and how to leverage them in the spirit of a safe flight 
is a fun and confidence building journey. Again, I'll use the term accountable. We're all accountable to be proficient. We're all accountable to know all of the systems and how to leverage them, whether we want to or we're forced into it. And I think it's just a blast learning how to do that. I know you will too. Interested in your comments below, please like and subscribe. And until next time, blue skies and tailwinds.